Welcome to the 2020 Pasadena Festival of Women Authors Online. I'm Nora Morley, the chairperson for the 2020 festival. Although we were unable to hold our event in person this year due to the coronavirus, we are so happy to present all seven of our festival authors online in videos like this one. Our mission is to recognize the accomplishments of women authors, to advance community dialogue about literature, and to raise money for nonprofit literary programs. I want to thank the volunteers on our committee for all of their hard work. Since the first year in 2009, they have presented over 55 authors and have raised over $350,000 for grants to the community. With the proceeds of our 2019 event, we were able to make grants to the One City, One Story program at the Pasadena Public Library, the Pasadena City College Writer-in-Residence, Visiting Writer, and Summer Creative Writing programs, the Pasadena Senior Center Masters in Learning program, the PEN America Emerging Voices Fellowship program, and Write Group. The signature of our festival is that our authors tell us their personal story, the story of their journey as a writer and as a woman. First, our author will be introduced by a member of our author selection committee. Then the author will speak about her journey. And lastly, there will be a question and answer session. Before we go to our author stories, I would like to thank our sponsors for their generosity. Our lead sponsor at the publisher level, Clifford Swan Investment Counselors, and our sponsors at the editor and novel levels. We hope that you'll consider making a donation and purchasing our author's books through the links at the end of this video or by going to our website. And now, enjoy this author's story. Hello and welcome. I'm Teresa Payton with the Author Selection Committee and it is my honor to present Myla Goldberg in her stunning new novel, Feast Your Eyes. Myla is coming to us today from Brooklyn, New York. She graduated from Oberlin College with an English degree. She always knew she would write and she designed her life to make it so. In 2000, her award-winning first novel, Bee Season, was a New York Times bestseller and was released as a highly acclaimed movie in 2005. Feast Your Eyes is her fourth novel. It was a finalist for the 2019 National Book Critics Award. It's the story of a striving avant-garde street photographer who moves from Cleveland to New York in the 1960s to record unposed windows in a moment of time on the gritty streets and alleys of New York. An unexpected pregnancy complicates her path to her goals and her ability to be an ideal mom. The structure of the book is a catalog for a posthumous art exhibit at MoMA, curated by her long estranged daughter. Through diaries, letters, and interviews with her mom's friends and lovers, the daughter gains insight into her mother, her ambitions, and her struggles to, ba to balance her prodigious talent with the love of her daughter. Themes of abortion, pornography, and notoriety shape the story. When the exhibit of her photographs of she and her young child partially nude is opened, the state brings pornography charges. The artist and her daughter become pawns in the harsh publicity of the day, and the argument about what constitutes art, a la Diane Arbus and Sally Mann of that same period. The MoMA photography exhibit is a visual feast for the reader painted entirely with words. We keenly feel the power and the beauty of these photographs. Myla is a master at this. The book asks many hard questions, and chief among these is what must an artist sacrifice to be successful? Myla, we are so excited to have you here today. Come, please join us. Thanks for having me, Teresa. And I don't, you just said everything. You did such a great job, so I'm done. Thank you and good night. Um, but yeah, it was a great introduction, so thank you. Well, so you can go home now? Yeah, yeah, we're good. 
<laughs> we are home now. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. We are um, really looking forward to your conversation. Well, thanks. I'm looking forward to it too. All right. Bye bye. Yeah. See ya. Um, so, hey, everybody. It really is exciting to be here, even though here is my house, but it's not. We're together. We're actually together, thanks to the 21st century. And I'm just thrilled that in these extenuating circumstances, we can still find ways to do this. Um, so that's, yeah, it makes my heart glad. Um, Feast Your Eyes started to me with a question, you know, is it possible to be both a great artist and a great parent? Or did you do one of those really well? Does one of those have to get kicked to the curb? Um, it was not an academic or hypothetical question for me at the time. Um, when I started working on this book, I had little kids. I had a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. And so I felt basically in perpetual conflict. I was, you know, I would be at home and in my office working. And I think, oh my gosh, I should be with my family. But then I'd be with my kids. I was like, oh, I want to be writing right now. And so I was just, it was a constant tug of war back and forth trying to figure out how, how does one do this sort of thing? So, you know, as always is with me when I have a question like that, I turn to books for the answer. And so um, I began kind of just looking for role models. I started reading lots of biographies of women who were artists um, and hoping to see people who maybe did it right. Um, and so I read and I read, and I have to say that the results I found were not terribly heartening. Um, everything that I read just kind of made me feel more and more discouraged um, because, you know, I found a spectrum of answers to that question. You know, how does one balance one's ambition with one's, you know, responsibilities with one's, you know, my competing desires. And I found a spectrum of responses to that question. Um, one extreme was Dorothea Lange, right, the award-winning canonical WPA photographer she actually paid someone to take care of her children. She put her two boys in the care of another person, gave them money, and then went off and became the amazing photographer she was. Um, you can read her children's memoirs to figure out how much they like that answer to the question. Um, on the other extreme, you had someone like Sally Mann, who, um, when she was faced with the question, you know, art, family, she's like, ah, let me murder them. And so she ended up making photographs about her children. And in 1990, she published a book called Immediate Family, which shows these beautiful, um, you know, beautifully composed, beautifully executed, um, very narrative photographs of her children, mostly naked in various um, complex settings. And um, the out, the kind of the fallout for that was immediate and nothing that she had anticipated. It ended up being just there's a lot of negative aspects to that that she had not counted on. Um, and so I was just kind of trying to navigate this for myself, trying to find answers and not finding them. And I think that's probably why I wrote the book. Um, for me, writing fiction has always been a way of answering questions for myself. Um, it's very important to me that fiction be personal. In fact, I think all fiction to be good has to be personal. However, I draw a very kind of firm distinction between personal, the personal and the autobiographical. I am very interested in writing personal fiction. I am not in the least interested in writing autobiographical fiction. And so here's the difference in my mind. Autobiographical fiction, which really has been on the rise, I feel like as a, as a form, it's getting more and more you know, prominent, um, is basically someone who writes their life, but calls it a novel, maybe changes a couple things around, but is basically writing their life as they were living it. Um, I have big problems with that. Um, number one, I write fiction because I like to make things up. Also, I'm very private. You know, once we've gotten to know each other, maybe, you know, we're friends, we've known each other for a while. Yeah, I'll tell you about my mom, but it's not the first thing I'd want a total stranger to know about me. And then beyond just my own feelings of wanting to be a private person, there's all the people in my life. Do they ask to be written about? Do they want to be on someone else's pages? I think probably not. Um, these are not questions that get asked very much. Um, it's something that I ended up returning to think about a lot as I wrote this book. But so for me, what was spurring me was the very personal question of this kind of art life balance, but to make it something that didn't feel autobiographical, to give myself the kind of perspective and distance I would need to write it true, I needed to put it in a different milieu and with different people than were me. And so that's what I mean by personal fiction. I take a question that I have, or I take a psychological experience or an emotion that I have had, and then I instill it into a fictional character in a fictional milieu, and that allows 
allows me to explore it very fully with perspective and distance that kind of allows me to do it in a safe way, but also in an imaginative and creative way because I'm unfettered. I can go anywhere I want with it. And so that's why the protagonist of this book, Lillian, she's not a writer, she's a photographer. Um, and while it's set in New York, which is where I live, it's not in the New York of the present. It's the New York of the 50s and 60s. So that difference of moving to a different art form, that difference of moving to a different time gave me that perspective that I needed to kind of look on this question in a balanced way and just in a very clear way what I could write in whatever direction my imagination wanted to take me. And so that's how it began. And so it began with reading all those biographies of artists. And then I kept going from there. Um, I'm a huge library nerd, so I really love researching my books. And most of my books do take place in various eras. So being able to learn about the 50s and 60s for this one was really, really fun, especially in New York of the 50s and 60s. And so I read, um, I read a lot of memoirs, actually. I read the memoir of Diane de Prima, which was incredibly enlightening. Um, and I read a bunch of other ones. And then the book, though, that I think really, really transformed the way that I thought about this whole this whole novel was a book called The Choices We Made. And it's a collection of essays um, of women writing about their abortions. Um, the first half of it, the first, I guess, 20 essays are women writing about abortion that they had when abortion was still illegal. And um, these women are prominent women and they give their names. They are not anonymous in these essays. And I'm a 1997, I'm a 1971 baby. I was born post Roe v. Wade. So intellectually, I always knew that abortion was hard to get, that it was difficult, that it was traumatic. But I didn't have any real understanding of that until I read this book. And the essays that I read, the words that I read, the experiences that I encountered there, just were shattering. Um, they completely blasted my mind open and made me realize the degree to which, you know, that law um, deformed women's lives, ended women's lives, reshaped dramatically, you know, just everything, all of existence for women at that time and the women's partners, the people who were supporting them. And that's when I realized that I wanted that to be a central part of the book. I wanted to explore that in a way that would make it come alive for people like myself who and have maybe an intellectual idea of that era, but just did not have a real sense of it at all. Um, you know, I started, this book took me eight years to write. Um, I started it one administ presidential administration ago. And so when I was writing it, I thought I was very much writing historical fiction when I was, you know, exploring these issues. Well, you know, <laughs> presidential administration changed and that kind of made this feel even more urgent than ever because the things that I was reading about in that book are now happening. You know, the same kinds of troubles and issues and laws that were being passed that by then that were blocking women's ability to choose, they're coming back. They are back, especially in, you know, the Southeast. Um, so it just became really important to me to explore it. And I just, I became very grateful for the opportunity to explore it in this fashion. Um, so that's a big part of the book. Um, Teresa gave a great summary, so I'm not even going to do more of that because you're going to read the book for yourself and see, but she's right. The book takes the form of a catalog. Um, it's the catalog for the retrospective posthumous museum exhibition of Lillian's photos. So the entire book is a title of a photo and then a description, which is then followed by an excerpt from Lillian's journals or letters or a description that um, her daughter gives of the photo or an interview excerpt from one of the many people who are close to Lillian at different phases of her life. And then also through that, through those descriptions, you do build kind of a picture library in your mind of Lillian's photographs. Um, and that was super fun to work on too. I actually lived with a bunch of different street photographers books on my desk and I read through them um, as I went. And so sometimes um, in the description of a photo, you get an actual photograph that an actual street photographer took. I will just describe that photo. But since it's just words, I get to do it um, because it's not the image. I didn't have to ask for permission. Um, and so some of them just fit my purposes perfectly well. Other times I would see a photo and I think, ah, oh, the foreground of this is really what I could use for Lillian's work, but I need to change the background. And so I would use the foreground and then put in a different background. Other times I needed the background, but a different foreground. Other times I liked the corner of a photo. And so I would enlarge it in my imagination and then describe that and that became Lillian's photo. And then other times I just made up the photo of whole cloth, you know, completely from my imagination. But it was a blast to do. It was a lot of fun. And if I've done my job correctly, when you're reading the book, those photos really are gonna come to life for you. 
Um, the thing that Lillian grapples with is, you know, the issue of, you know, the degree to which her life should be in her work. And it takes the form specifically of these dual photographs that she takes of herself and her daughter, Samantha. Um, there's a series that ends up getting called the Samantha series um, by kind of the public at large of photos of Samantha in various states of nudity and then of herself with Samantha. The one that gets them in the most hot water is one that she took of the two of them when Samantha was comforting her in the wake of an illegal abortion. And that's the one that the vice squad ends up clamping down on. That's the one that most makes them infamous as this story proceeds. And um, what was sort of a isolated idea back in the 50s and 60s, you know, using one's children in one's work, that's sort of something that now is a part of everyday life for a huge swath of people, right? I mean, there's mommy blogs, there's Instagram and social media accounts and YouTube videos where people just look, look at my kid, look at this funny thing that they did. Um, oh, and look at all the views that I got for this thing. And I feel like there are some very essential ethical questions that are not being asked as we kind of blazon into this age of just kind of using whatever's at hand to promote ourselves, to create images for ourselves out in the world. Um, I think that it's important to ask permission. And I think that there are, when you're a child, you can't give that kind of permission. It's impossible to give informed consent when you're eight years old. Um, this is something I grappled with a lot um, because, you know, I think Lillian faces that issue um, when she's working with these photographs. And it was inspired to a degree by Sally Mann, who very much faced that issue. Um, you know, I don't think it's possible to foresee all of those questions and all the gradations of those questions when you're working, especially when you're young. You know, Lillian was in her 20s. I think Sally Mann was also quite young when she had her children and was making these decisions. Um, and so it's really with the benefit of hindsight as an author working through this book for eight years that I was able to kind of grapple with these questions. But they're very real and there's questions that I think we as a society need to ask ourselves. When are we allowed to include our loved ones and our friends in our own building of public identity. What is cool to put out there and what is not cool to put out there? Um, I'd love for that to become more of a larger national conversation. Um, and the question of work-life balance, I mean, that's not just for writers, it's for everybody. Anyone who has um, ambitions outside their home, male or female, it is a question we ask ourselves, how do we do it all? Is it possible to do it all? Do I have to compromise to do it all? Um, and so, you know, as I said, this was a process for me. This is an eight year book. And um, I was very lucky in that as I was sort of making my way through this process, um, I ended up at a Louise Bourgeois retrospective at the Guggenheim. I live in Brooklyn. And so I get to, well, when life is normal, I get to go to Manhattan and go to the museums, which is one of the things I love to do most. And so I was at the Guggenheim and there was a Louise Bourgeois retrospective. And Louise Bourgeois is mostly known for her sculptures, um, but she's also done paintings and most other forms. I mean, she was spectacular. And so the way that the Guggenheim works, if you've ever been there, round building, spiral, it's really cool. And so when they have a retrospective, at the base of the ramp is the kind of the beginning of the person's life. And then you go around up and up the ramp and you kind of move through their life as you go up. And I do this thing whenever I go to art museums, which I thought everybody did until I started talking to people about it and everyone was giving me strange looks. And what that is, is, you know, like the placards next to art. I always will look at the placard and I will immediately do the math. I will see when that piece of art was made and I will look at when that artist was born and I will do the math to figure out how old they were when they made that work of art. And this started when I was a little kid. And so I look, I was like, oh, okay, when I'm 25, I need to have done something that good. And now that I'm a middle-aged lady, it's like, oh man, I should have done something that good 10 years ago. I blew my chance, we're all done. Um, but it's something I compulsively do. So here I was at the Louise Bourgeois retrospective and I was making my way up the ramp and I was doing the math. And in the beginning of the retrospective, bursts of work, just so much dense work, lots and lots of stuff. And then all of a sudden the work tapered off. There wasn't as much work. And I was like, oh, what's going on? So I did the math. I looked at the years. I looked at her biography. I was like, oh, she had three boys. She's in the middle of raising three boys right now. There's not a lot of work going on. And then I kept going up the ramp. And then all of a sudden the work returned. And when it returned, it was more complex, more interesting, more accomplished than anything I had seen previously further down the ramp. And I was like, oh, I did the math. Her kids have gotten older now. She's emerged out the other side of motherhood and look what happened. And that's when it struck me that this battle that I thought I had been fighting, these competing forces, motherhood with ambition, you know, being an artist, being a writer with being a mother, 
they aren't in competition at all. In fact, they're working together and they've been working together all the time because I realized that one of the many things that probably made Louise Bourgeois that amazing artist on the other side of that was the fact that she had gone through motherhood. I mean, as a parent, a parenthood requires of you new levels of, of empathy, a new way of caring for persons, a new way of loving people that is just utterly unique to the process of parenting. So in the process of being a parent, I was being made a better human. And anything that makes me a better human makes me a better writer. And so Louise Bourgeois's work was kind of the proof in the pudding for me because I saw that happening to her. I saw her being a better artist out the other end. And all of a sudden, you know, it didn't get easier. You know, it's, it's still pretty hard, but I did feel more at peace with it because I was like, okay, I'm going to work slower now, but I'm going to work deeper and I'm going to work better. And what's going to come out at the other end is going to be something that is remarkable. And it's going to be a, a portrait of the experience that I've had in being a parent and doing all these things all at the same time. And so that's kind of where I got left by the end of this process. And so it's a happy place. So yeah, there you go. And I am super excited to answer any of all questions at this point, because that's always my favorite part of these things. So Teresa, if you want to come back, and I know we've got some people in the audience, let's do it. You are anticipating me, Myla. Thank you. Your talk was so enlightening and, and exciting. I thank you. Sure, it was a pleasure. Okay, so um, let's go to the questions. Okay, so I see that Akila has the first question. Thank you, Teresa. My name's Akila Gibbs. I'm the executive director of the Pasadena Senior Center. Myla, I loved your passion and, and energy. Uh, and I also love photography. And like Lillian, um, I learned about photography in high school and was on the high school photography club too. Um, my question to you is this, how were you able to translate photographs into such eloquent words? Aw, thanks Akila. Um, I'm just a really visual thinker is the short answer to that. Um, you know, I can't draw at all. <laughs> and I wish I could actually, I'm kind of a method actor writer. So when I get into a character, I try to kind of inhabit them. So for, I actually bought myself um, a fancy camera, fancy-ish camera as in not my phone and um, decided to try to be a street photographer so I could kind of inhabit that world for a little while. And um, turns out real hard. <laughs> um, I went out with the, my camera and what really, I guess, kept throwing me again and again was Similar to the, the issue, you know, that I was just talking about in my talk, you know, what's okay to put in your work and what's not. I'd look at a person, I was like, oh my gosh, they'd be amazing to photograph. I was like, wait, is that cool? Am I allowed? Is that, you know, like, I was like, wait, should I ask them for permission? And obviously you ask them for permission, you ruin the shot. It's gone. The magic moment has passed. But if you don't ask for permission and then you just take it, that's just kind of rude, isn't it? And also you might really piss them off. So like, I was thinking, okay, well, I could take it and then ask their permission and then like erase the photo if they say no. And so like, I was just, ah, I was just tormented by this issue. And, it, and in my researches, I realized that yes, that was actually, it's a really kind of basic question that every street photographer grappled with. And just as there were a spectrum of answers to the kid artist question that I was reading about in biographies, I found a spectrum of responses to how to deal with that question of permission or not permission. So on the one extreme, you had Gary Winogrand and he just went click and just like ran off. And like, so if you actually look at his work, there's a lot of really pissed off people <laughs> in his <laughs> photographs that look like they want to throttle him because he did not care. Um, then you had someone like Walker Evans and he actually constructed a camera that he would be standing with his camera like this, but actually the lens was facing that way. He had constructed these mirrors so that when he looked like he was looking one direction, he was secretly looking in the other wow. direction. And so that, that allowed him to take photographs on the sly. And then you had someone like Dan Arbus she would just move in with someone. She would just live with them. She'd sleep with them. She'd get to know them really well. She'd take their picture all the time. And so it just became integrated into kind of the, the tapestry of their lives. And so they didn't notice so much. And so that was, but I think this is a very long winded answer to your question, but I think the experience <laughs> of going out with a camera and trying to do that 
did help me to kind of think through the visuals because I could see sort of the emotions and the psychology behind the actual taking of the pictures, which I feel I could maybe add to the experience of just the pure descriptions. The descriptions, that part was frankly kind of easy. Like, I mean, that's what I think, I think in images all the time. And so mm -hmm. actually having images that I could look at, because like I talked about how, you know, I had those, the monographs on my desk. And so what I'd done is I actually, I looked through these books, looked looking for pictures that kind of said Lillian to me. And so I was able to kind of build a fake body of work based on the, the work of these other people. And I would have little post-it notes on the pages in the monographs of all the images that I felt like were consistent with the photographer that I was trying to invent. And so then as I was writing, whenever I'd get to a new section that needed a new photograph, I would pick up a monograph and I'd kind of page through to all my little post-it note pages like, ah, oh, this one, this one, maybe this one plus this, half of this and half of this. And so it was actually super easy a lot of the time because there was the image for me that I could then manipulate in my mind the way that I needed. So as an amateur photographer myself, what kind of camera did you buy? Oh, goodness gracious. It is a sign of my total amateurism that I can't even tell you. I get oh, it multiple choice. It was, you know, a camera. It had a lens and a little click, click, a well, little button press to take a picture I, with it. I went to Diane Arbus's uh, exhibit when it was in Los Angeles, and it was absolutely fabulous. I loved it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's um, her that that also came to. And actually, this is an interesting thing about Diane Arbus is so when I was writing my book and I was writing it to be this catalog, I was like, is this too like too much of a cheat? Is it just asking too much of the reader to believe that a catalog could have these things in it? And then uh, if, if you're speaking of the, the Diane Arbus exhibit called Revelations, which is sort of the right, massive yeah. retrospective. Right. So it came to the Met and the Met had, and probably this book was at all the museums, the catalog for that exhibition had the same stuff in it. There's like diary entries from yeah. Diane Arbus and interviews. I was like, oh, I'm good. Look, it's real life doing what I'm doing too. So yeah, it all worked out. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you, Akila. Great question, Akila. Our second question is from Betty. Hi, I'm Betty Sargent, and I am a member of the Author Selection Committee, and I really loved your presentation. It was so energetic, and I, too, have been an amateur photographer, so it all resonates with me. And I hope this question doesn't feel redundant to you, but I, I just wanted to ask how your experience as an artist and a writer and a mother uh, influenced your writing of the novel. Um, well, yes, it all did. Um, and you're right, I did talk about that a bit. So I'm going to actually turn that question on you a around a little bit, because what was interesting is by kind of trying to explore these issues with, um, with Lillian and Samantha, I ended up actually returning to my own experience of being a daughter. And I guess, I guess the thing that was most productive about this book is I got to I got to look at life from both sides now. Um, I got to be, I got to do the mother thing and the daughter thing and just kind of go back and forth, kind of toggle in my mind as needed as I wrote in a way that I think had I been younger, had I been a younger parent or closer to my own teenage years and adolescence and young adulthood, I would not have been able to do with sort of kind of the, the perspective that I can do now, now that I'm an old middle-aged lady. And so I, yeah, think, I, think, <laughs> I think that probably, like, you know, but I was, you know, I've got now my daughters are 16 and 13. So I've been doing this for a while and I'm 48. So I've been alive for a while and my, my formative years are enough behind me that I do have the perspective to kind of pull from both in ways that are really artistically helpful that I think if I were closer to that material, it would be more difficult. A marvelous answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so our third question is from Grace. Hi, uh, thank you, Teresa. Uh, I loved the presentation and the talk. It was amazing. Uh, I'm Grace Lyde. I'm an alumni with the Right Girl and representing Right Girl today. Uh, my question is, uh, structuring the story as a curated catalog of an exhibit is a really unusual approach to writing a novel. Was formatting it like this, was that a challenge or a freedom? I love it when people ask me about the structure. Thank you, Grace. Um, yeah, it, yes is the answer to that question, um, is the short answer. Um, so, I mean, I think all stories can be told in the conventional beginning, middle, end way, but I think almost every story also cont contains a maybe more unconventional way of telling 
that can maybe help bring out certain aspects of it. And I've always been drawn to stories that are unconventional in their form. I always like to read them and I like to try to write them. This isn't the first time I've tried to do something a little wonky. Um, this particular structure, um, just as I borrowed slash stole uh, photo photographs from the monographs of these various street photographers, I had read, I'm a huge fan of Stephen Milhauser, the, the author. And when I'm a huge fan of a writer, I'm a completist. I read everything. I read the B-sides, I read the deep cuts. And so he has a collection of novellas called Little Kingdoms. And in the middle novella of that collection is called um, Exhibitions, Portraits from the Exhibition. And it actually does take the form of a museum catalog. And it uses descriptions of a painter's work to kind of give in broad strokes the arc of his life. And I read that and I was like, oh, that's super cool. I really like that. And boy, can you do more with that than what he's doing? And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to be the one to try. And so it was the Stephen Milhauser novella that kind of inspired me to try to do this. And it just fit so perfectly what I was trying to do is, um, and yeah, sometimes I wanted to tear my hair out. And sometimes it was liberating. Um, constraint does kind of um, spark things in ways you're gonna come up when you're constrained in a certain way, it makes your mind go to places that it wouldn't normally have to go. And so I think that different forms and structures, and if you talk to poets, I think they'll tell you the same thing, you know, sestinas and sonnets and all that stuff, they're there for a reason. Um, so yeah, it, it was both a, li a liberation and a frustration, but even in the frustration, it kind of made this creative crucible for maybe going in ways that I wouldn't have been able to go otherwise. Was there, um, that's a wonderful answer. Uh, was there anything that you were like worried that you weren't gonna be able to do because of the constraint? Um, yeah, and in fact, <laughs> there were things I was not able, this book was a hundred pages longer um, in it's like the form that I originally was working with with my editor. And there's all this really great sex that happens between Samantha and her high school boyfriend. Um, really good sex scenes. Like I was, they were so hot. I was so good at it. I was so excited. And then I'm like going over with my editor. She's like, well, you know, in a museum catalog, it really is all about Lillian. And so really every entry has to be very directly concerned with Lillian and her life. And I was like, oh, you're right. <laughs> so all that sex gone. So um, yes, I would say that the, but in the end, I think that was a good thing because I knew that I needed this novel to be tight and I needed it to be really propulsive and energetic and always moving forward. And I think the structure kept me honest in that way. It didn't allow me to take these scenic byways and vistas because I needed to keep my eye on the prize and just like, it's about Lillian. Everything needs to relate directly to Lillian. And so the structure was good for that. Well, thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Vinita. Hi. Thank you, Teresa. Myla, you were just awesome. Thank you. Uh, I'm Vanita Swaminathan, professor of English from Pasadena City College. I'm the chair of PCC's Writer in Residence program. This program uh, aims to enrich the cultural environment of the college and the community. Um, I'm very grateful and honored that this writer in, program, writer in residence program is funded by uh, Pasadena Festival of Women Authors. My question to you, Myla, is what differences did you find between the social attitude toward abortion in the 60s as opposed to the present day? Um, Vanita, that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking it. Um, what's interesting is what I was struck more by is the similarities, kind of really depressingly, the similarities in culture that surround abortion, which I think is one of the reasons it remains such a huge issue and a problem in our nation. And that's because we don't talk about it. Um, it was taboo back then. It was something to be ashamed of. It was something you were not to mention. And even though it's legal now and it's been legal for decades, that is still the case. Women can be, you know, they will have an abortion and they won't tell the people most close to them. They won't tell their best friends, they won't tell their partners, they won't tell their family. And that's why we are stuck because, because the shame still is attached to this, because it's still seen as something that's taboo, because we're not discussing it, it hasn't become normalized in any way, shape or form. And as long as 
that remains as long as it is this anathema thing and it's seen as this weird, you know, bad, you know, judgment thing that women do, it, we're not going to be able to have the conversations that we need to have so that as a nation we can move forward and make some very important decisions about women's bodies and about rights and the laws that need to be passed. And it's not, they're not easy discussions, you know. We don't agree and we shouldn't. We're all different people. We have different backgrounds, we have different beliefs and that should stay the same. But what needs to go away is the fear that surrounds exploring those differences and having those conversations. And so that I would say, that's the thing that gets me, that just gets me so sad and so upset and so happy when someone like you asks these questions. I've, you know, I've been, this book is now in paperback. So I had a year of traveling with it in hardcover and I was looking forward to having this kind of conversation a lot more than I did. I was hoping this would open up the doors for us to begin to have these conversations because we need to, we absolutely have to for things to change. Thank you very much. It's really true because I'm from the 60s and I can see that there has been no change. You know, we didn't talk about it then. We are not talking enough about it now. So thank you exactly. so much for this. Thank you, Anita. Well, thank you. Um, Emily, you're next. Hi, I'm Emily Vuitton. I'm a volunteer with the Pasadena Festival of Women Authors and involved in our open book on location program as well. Here's my question. At the end of the book, Lillian makes a very unexpected and compelling artistic decision. Where did this come from and why did you um, decide to do this? Ooh, that's a really good one. Um, and let's talk about this in a way that people who haven't read the book will be able to discover that decision for themselves. So um, yes, we're gonna tempt you, all you readers out there to make you wonder, what are we talking about? Um, so, you know, Lillian is a person who, for her, her art lies at the center of her life. It is very much a part of who she is. Um, she wouldn't be herself without it. Her life has revolved around it. And so the decision that she makes, the, to, the kind of the final project that she embarks on at the end of her life, I think is very much reflective of, of her desire to record life and people as honestly and transparently as possible, to recall all phases of life, to make a record, to pass on for people to see. And, and it's kind of, it was, I think her photographing people and herself was her way to try to understand, um, you know, people and the world around her. And so I think the decision she makes at the end of her life marks her desire to continue to understand as much as possible and to pass on that understanding to others once she's gone. And it was in part inspired by Richard Avedon. Um, I went to his retrospective. We were just talking earlier about the amazing Dan Arbus retrospective that was at the Met. Um, there was even earlier than that, a Richard Avedon retrospective, and he did a remarkable series of portraits of, of his father as his father was dying. And um, they included, if I'm remembering right, you saw some portraits of his father when he was near death, and some then portraits of his father after death. And um, I was transfixed by those, and I stared at them for a really, really long time. I found them really, really moving. Um, that was years and years before I wrote this book, but as I began then writing this book, and in fact, Avedon's pictures were not ones, his book, his work was not one of the ones on my desk as I was working, but that exhibit really stuck with me and I think ended up shaping some of the decisions I made as I got to the end of Lillian's life. Thank you so much. One last question we have. Um, do you think that women artists have to sacrifice much more than men artists? Um, short answer, uh-huh, yeah, definitely. But um, I should amend that to say that, I mean, okay, historically, absolutely. I mean, if you look at the structure of society, if you look at the expectations placed on women, if you look at the barriers to them every step of the way, yeah, completely. Um, and that was one thing that as, you know, a, a 20, you know, I was born, you know, mid, late-ish 20th century, now into the 21st century, I very much appreciate um, you know, the shoulders that I am standing on and the things that are much easier for me to do than say someone of Lillian's generation. That said, I am shocked by how much, again, I, this is just like we were talking about before with Benita, how much has not changed between those two eras. You know, how many women think of themselves as like having these modern marriages and they're still doing all the childcare and they're still doing all the laundry and they're still doing all the cooking and somehow it's different because now they also have a job so now they're modern. Um, but that said, 
there is also a generation of men who are stepping forward. Um, and I'm, I'm the perfect example of that. The reason I'm able to do the work that I do is I have a partner who is a full partner in the raising of our children. Um, my husband, Jason, is also an artist and he's a teacher. And from day one, we have split everything down the middle. He, you know, we take turns cooking, we split childcare, and that's what has let me be the artist and the writer that I am today. And that's still a minority but it is less so. Um, and, but what's interesting, I think, for men, men who are doing that, they're not being recognized yet. And so they kind of live in this little weird gendered ghetto where a man shows up at the playground and all the moms, like, you know, they keep their distance. They kind of look askance at him because it's weird to have a man at the playground. And so I think men who are stepping up and trying to be the equal parent and shouldering the responsibilities I have a really hard time right now and I'm really interested in hearing more from them as that becomes more and more common because they have some really important things to say. Wow. Wow. Thank you for that. You sharing today with us your life and your energy has been a fabulous, fabulous moment for us and I appreciate it so much. Thanks, Teresa. Oh, and look, it's the book. Isn't it pretty? The, the cover, the hardcover was black, but then they changed it to blue for the paperback, which, yeah. So, yes. So when you go out and buy the book, having now listened to me get you so excited about book, this is what you should look for. So there we go. Okay. Okay, Myla. Well, I'd like to thank our Zoom audience for being here with us today. It's been really a pleasure to host this conversation with you. I'd like to also invite you to make some donations or buy Myla's paperback book. Q, Myla. You need oh, here it is, yep, here's the Q, here's the book. It's a paperback, there you go. Uh, uh, to buy Myla's book, there'll be, there is a, uh, some, some buttons at the bottom of this video and also you can come onto the PFWA website and make donations and buy books and we would appreciate it and we need it. Thank you.